When Marie Curie and Pierre Curie discovered the radioactive substance radium in 1898 and then successfully isolated it in 1902, it didn't really serve any kind of purpose or usefulness, although it was a massive breakthrough. And a year later, Marie Curie won a Nobel Prize along with her husband for the discovery of the radioactive element, making her the first ever woman to win a Nobel Prize. And she dedicated many years afterwards in tirelessly researching the element, and eventually she won a second Nobel Prize, now making her the only woman to win twice, as well as becoming the first female professor at her university. She would later turn her interest to the medical field, trying to find if radioactive substances could help improve medical care, and it wasn't long before she discovered that radium was capable of killing human cells, more importantly, cancerous cells. And it wasn't long before radium was literally seen as a miracle element, something that could actually boost your immune system, something that was good for you in many ways. After all, if it can help against a battle with cancer, then this strange element must be good for you in numerous other ways. And shockingly, it was even backed up by people in the medical profession, and of course, scam artists who just wanted to make their fortune. It seemed that whatever ailment you may have, radium was being advertised as the most likely cure for you. At one point in history, it was even sold in drinking water as a tonic, as a way to boost the immune system. Radium even found its way into everyday household products like cleaning supplies. It was literally everywhere. It was even being promoted on advertisements for women's beauty products, claiming that these beauty products containing radium could actually benefit a woman's skin. Now, if this seems shocking, try and remember that this was the early 1900s and it wasn't commonly known that radium was actually very, very dangerous. And that's not to say it wasn't suspected by some, but it was the early days and the effects of radiation poisoning just wasn't known. It wasn't long before it was discovered that radium could be used in other ways. The element already gave off what most probably thought was a beautiful glow, but when it was discovered that if you mix the element with another substance, such as zinc, it actually glowed green. And it wasn't long before this was turned into a paint that could be applied to objects, mainly military instruments such as the dials on watches, making the hands on the face of the watch glow in the dark. And with the start of the First World War, demand for these glow-in-the-dark watches and other instruments was very high in demand and it was proving to be a very profitable business to be involved in. In 1914, Radium Luminous Material Corporation was founded, and its main purpose was to extract and purify the radium. And then, eventually, they moved into the production of the luminous paint, and then they started to introduce factories where the glow and the dark watches could be produced. The first factory opened in 1917 in Orange, New Jersey and employed over 300 workers, mostly women, to make these radioactive watches. And by 1920, two other factories had opened up, one in Ottawa, Illinois, and the third in Waterbury, Connecticut. And business was good. The company was the number one supplier to the military. But the owners of the company and the scientists all involved all knew too well the effects of working with radioactive material, such as radium and they were all very careful when handling the radioactive paint. But the owners of the business didn't quite have the same kind of concern for the well-being and health of their staff, and provided no kind of protective gear and didn't make the workers aware that it could actually be hazardous. And over time, many of the women workers would die in horrendous ways, as the radiation poisoning literally destroyed them from the inside out. And over time, they became known as the Ghost Girls, or more popular, the Radium Girls. The radioactive paint that the girls used was actually marketed in numerous adverts and given the brand name Undark. And before we go any further, I would just like to read out to you one of these advertisements that was going around at the time. And you will notice that the company were actually painting a lot more than just watch dials. And bear this in mind, the company may have been aware of the risks. Okay, so the advert was posted by the Radium Luminous Material Corporation and they're advertising the new paint Undark, which they used to paint the dials with. It begins off by saying, the power of radium at your disposal. 23 years ago, radium was unknown. Today, thanks to constant laboratory work, the power of this most unusual of elements is at your disposal. Through the medium of Undark, radium serves you safely and surely. Does Undark really contain radium? Most assuredly, it is radium combined with exactly the proper manner with zinc sulfide, 
which gives Undark its ability to shine continuously in the dark. Manufacturers have been quick to recognise the value of Undark. They apply it to the dials of watches and clocks, to electric push buttons, to buckles of bedroom slippers, to house numbers, flashlights, compasses, gasoline gorges, autometers and many other articles which you frequently wish to see in the dark. The next time you fumble for a lighting switch, bark your shins on furniture, wonder vainly what time it is because of the dark. Remember, undark, it shines in the dark. Now, as you can tell from that advertisement, the company was literally painting anything. But it's hard to say whether they were aware of the full extent of the dangers of radium. They were wearing protective gear, the bosses and the scientists were all wearing protective gear, but they weren't giving it to the workers. But the fact that the bosses and the scientists were wearing protective gear tells you that they knew it was radioactive, they knew it was dangerous, but they still refused to give protection to the women. They would later say that they thought the women weren't working with enough radium to come to any harm, but the company told a lot of lies later on when they were actually held liable for all of the women who had actually died. The women who worked in the factory sat in rows and they were dressed in their own clothing. Remember, there was no protective equipment, no protective gear at all. Beside each woman would have been a wooden tray full of watch dials and depending on the size of the watch, there would have either been 24 dials or 48. There would also have been a small container of fine radium powder that had been mixed with zinc sulfide that gave the dust a brilliant glow. The workers would then take their very fine paintbrush made with camel hairs and dab a small amount of the radioactive dust into a small container, along with a little water and some gum arabic adhesive that when combined created the greenish white brilliantly glowing paint. And then the workers would go on to carefully paint the dials and watch faces, being sure not to waste any of the paint as radium was very, very expensive and any mishaps could lead to losing their jobs. And for those days, it was a very good job to have. Not many places paid so well. For each watch, the women would earn 1.5 cents and depending on how many watches they managed to paint that day, they could walk away with a pretty penny. So it was a job that they really wanted to keep. They must have felt blessed to work there. The girls who were employed at the factory were actually quite young. I think the youngest was actually 14 and I think the oldest was in the 30s maybe. So it was, for many, the first job that they'd walked into and it was very well paid and it just seemed like a dream job to some of these girls and they actually enjoyed working there. Little did they know the devastating effect that the radium was having on their bodies. Now, some of the women actually inquired if it was safe to be working with the radium without any protective gear, and they were told that it was, and they were perfectly safe. After all, radium was a miracle element. It was said to be great in giving people the boost they needed, whether that be with their health or simply as a beauty supplement, by selling items such as face creams and lipstick. Or maybe a health tonic, like I mentioned before, which was water laced with radium magic. Some even claimed that radium was even helpful in boosting sexual vitality. Radium was even used in the production of underwear, cleaning products, and unbelievably, butter and milk and toothpaste. Radium lace products were popping up everywhere, in the shops, on billboards, magazine advertisements, and the element even found its way into the lyrics of popular songs. And as far as the public was concerned, the element was simply a wondrous thing. Some people even included radium in the ingredients of their products, even if there was no radium actually in there, simply scamming their customers. So as you can imagine, the women at the factory simply accepted that the radium paint was safe. After all, how can something that is supposed to be so good for you be bad? And so the women carried on painting the watches, dabbing the radium dust with their brushes, which would send small plumes of the stuff into the air, which would then float down onto the women's skin and clothing and hair, giving each woman a very attractive glow about them, giving them the nickname, the Ghost Girls, which in hindsight is actually quite haunting. Now, when the women had finished painting a watch, the bristles of the brush would become uneven and messy. So, whilst painting the dials, each worker was ordered to place the bristles of the brush that was covered in radium paint between the lips after each stroke to ensure that the brush was back to a fine point, ready for the next watch to be painted. 
whilst the radium paint started its journey around the bloodstream. Some women claimed it tasted of nothing, some women complained it was gritty, and some actually liked the taste. And you're probably asking yourself, why would they voluntarily put this paint into the mouth? And now, what I'm going to remind you again is that at this time in history, people thought radium was healthy. So they probably didn't even think about it as they were doing it. And to give you an example of how safe they actually thought it was, some of the women actually used the paint to paint their own teeth with. And they would even arrive into work in their party dresses, knowing that when their shift was over, the clothing would be speckled with the illuminating radium furry dust. And when they went out to dance that night, the party dress would glow, along with the dazzling illuminating smile that was coming from the radium-covered teeth. Even though many believe radium was a good thing, not everyone shared this belief. On one particular day, the workers had a visit from one of the big bosses who paid a rare visit to the production line. As he was walking down the line of numerous women painting the watches, he noticed that one of the women placed a brush in between her lips. He insisted that she should not do this as it could make her ill. The woman looked at him very confused. After all, she was only following the instructions that her bosses had gave to her and everyone else. They even had a name for the technique, lip dip paint. And so because of this, the woman actually went and inquired if it was safe to come in contact with the radium paint. And once again, the bosses told her that it was perfectly safe. At the end of every shift, the women were asked to enter a room which was named the dark room because, well, it was dark. As they entered the dark room, they would literally light up. All the small dust particles could be seen all over the clothing, glowing brightly, and it was in this room that they were brushed down to rid them of the radium dust, but this wasn't done with the workers' best interests at heart. It was done to round up the radium dust particles to be reused. Like I said, the radium was expensive, and the women were always under pressure not to use too much of the paint, but the women worked as a team, and if one of them ran out of the paint, someone else would always help out and share their own material with their friend. At one point, the company even took away small jars of water that the girls had by their side and they used to clean their brush with, because most of the radium paint actually ended up resting at the bottom of the jar. This was a waste. And so they introduced rags that the women could use to make the brush into a point, but once again this proved too wasteful, so it was back to the lip dip paint method to save more money. And it was this lip dip paint method which would actually have devastating effects on the women in the near future. In fact, it is now known that one of the founders who actually invented the paint was well aware of the dangers of the radium after it was reported that he had actually handled the element too often and had noticed that his little finger had become infected by the radioactive material and basically his finger had died around the tip and so he actually hacked off his own finger, well, the tip of his little finger. And like I said before, the bosses and the scientists were actually wearing lead-lined aprons to protect them from the radioactivity. But still work on the shop floor went on just the same. Even after the war had ended, business was still good. Army supplies were not in great demand anymore, but the company actually started to supply undark paint to outside manufacturers, which meant that the company didn't need as many employees and some of the women were let go and some of the women actually left of their own accord, due to being absolutely exhausted and weak. But the women found that even when they started new employment, their health didn't seem to improve. If anything, it actually got worse. After one woman had actually visited the doctors on multiple occasions, a doctor told her that her blood results seemed very, very strange, and another woman left the factory after very painful sores appeared all over the inside of her mouth. Whilst another woman visited the doctors complaining of a strange glowing discharge that was coming from her nose. It would seem that the radium had started to take an effect on the women and it was starting to show. The women once again went to the bosses of the factory to ask them once again, is it safe? And once again, they were told it was. The factory even arranged an audience by some of the company experts on radium, actual doctors who ensured all the women once again that it was all very safe. But it was one particular woman who raised some serious concerns with the radium paint when she fell ill herself. 
But the journey to prove that the radium was dangerous was going to be a long one. And unfortunately, so was her suffering. The woman's name was Molly Magia. Molly was said to be one of the best when it came to producing the painted dials in large quantities. She was certainly a hard worker, but her enthusiasm for the job slowly died as she started to suffer from the effects of the radium paint that she had been working with over the years. It literally started to eat her from the inside out. It all started with a toothache, a very painful toothache that just wouldn't quit. And even when the tooth was removed, the hole that was left behind remained very painful. In fact, Molly was in agony. But it was only going to get worse as the pain started to spread into her jaw. She returned to the dentist many times to have more teeth removed, but still the pain remained. But she still managed to turn into work, inserting the brush into her mouth as her remaining teeth and ulcerating gums screamed out in agony as she swallowed the radium paint. Molly eventually returned to the dentist and the dentist couldn't help but notice that the rest of her teeth seemed loose and her gums were just not healing. Molly noticed that it wasn't only her teeth and her jaw that was in constant pain, she was also suffering with her arms, her legs, her feet and her hips. And over a short period of time, her remaining teeth became so loose that they practically fell out of her mouth. No one actually knew what was wrong with Molly, they just couldn't figure it out. Outrageously, some doctors did come up with a rather insulting diagnosis. They claimed that Molly must have syphilis. What other explanation could there be? Because the cause of the decay in Molly's mouth was unknown, suspicion fell upon the factory where Molly worked, but the company wasn't very helpful in providing the ingredients of the paint. Molly's condition worsened and her entire jaw and the roof of her mouth had swollen into a massive abscess. Molly returned to the dentist, and by now I can only imagine what kind of pain she was going through. The dentist asked Molly to open her mouth. And in all honesty, the dentist really didn't know what else he could do for Molly. He'd been treating her for some time, and it was looking like a hopeless situation. There was hardly any teeth left inside Molly's mouth. Even though most of Molly's teeth were now missing, the pain still remained. Molly was also complaining of an ongoing jaw ache that had become too much to bear. The dentist, at this stage, wasn't sure exactly what he could do to help. As he had done everything in his power to cure Molly, nothing was simply working. As he opened her mouth, the dentist wondered what he could do in this hopeless situation. There was hardly any teeth left inside her mouth, which was now a foul-smelling cesspit of bleeding pussy ulcers where her teeth had once been. The dentist applied the smallest amount of pressure with his fingers. As he prodded gently at the jaw, the bone snapped, or rather just came loose with very little effort at all. It came away from her face. He simply lifted a jawbone from her mouth with no effort. Molly was simply disintegrating from the inside out. Shortly after, the rest of Molly's jaw was removed just as easily with no surgery. The dentist simply took the jawbone with his own hands. From that day on, Molly would remain in her own home with constant care. What remained of her face where the jawbone simply disintegrated would randomly bleed without warning and her condition seemed to worsen. It seemed to spread. Now the pain was running into her throat. It was there that the radium eventually ended Molly's life as it ate through her jugular vein and she choked on her own blood and bled to death in absolute agony. Molly died on the 12th of September 1922. She was only 24 years of age. Molly was the first factory worker to die, but by 1924, nine other women would follow her to the grave. As business went on as usual at the factory, which now went under the name the United States Radium Corporation. There were many other deaths that followed as the factory went on manufacturing the undark paint, and radium remained the miracle cure. It was simply seen as a safe material, and the bosses at the factory insisted that the radium was safe, something they had always stood by. But some of the women who worked at the factory, especially the women who had been there a while, started to suffer in very similar ways, with toothache that resulted in teeth being pulled, and then eventually the radium would dissolve their jawbone. Some women developed aches and pains first, stiff limbs, sore backs due to the radium attacking the spine, fatigue, tiredness, and extreme weight loss. The horrendous, painful conditions that was literally eating the women from the inside out was often blamed on pneumonia, angina, 
or like Molly Maggio, they were diagnosed with syphilis. But if there was one connection with the deaths, it's that all the women worked for the United States Radium Corporation. The doctors and dentists who treated the women had always wondered if phosphorus was an ingredient in the paint and it was causing the decay. And the Luminous Corporation was more than happy to inform them that phosphorus was not an ingredient in the paint. And when tests were actually run, it was proven that phosphorus was not an ingredient. The Luminous Corporation probably thought that this was the end of it. But unfortunately for them, all suspicion now fell firmly on the radium. If it wasn't the phosphorus, it could only be the radium. And so five women decided to take legal action, some whilst literally on their deathbed fighting against a company who would constantly deny the dangers of the paint and make accusations against the women, claiming that they were simply trying to cheat the company out of money to pay medical bills because they had come down with illnesses such as syphilis. You see, this was actually a ploy by the factory. If they accused the women of actually coming down with syphilis, it was a way of shaming them in the public eye. But when more and more women started to die in very similar ways, it was becoming clear there was a connection and inspectors were sent to the factories to see if they could solve the mystery behind the deaths of the young women whose lives were coming to an end in such horrific ways. As the inspectors walked the floor of the factory, as the women worked hard painting, they couldn't help but notice that every now and again, the women would finish painting the dials, place the brush to the lips, and then into the paint and continue in this cycle. When the inspectors inquired about this, it is said that the factory bosses had the nerve to actually say that they told the women on multiple occasions not to do this, as it may be dangerous, but they just would not listen. It would seem that they were now afraid that maybe the paint was in fact hazardous. But after a full inspection was taken, shockingly, the results were once again that radium was not to blame. Although it was now believed by some scientists that radium was indeed very dangerous after many tests were ran on the element, but it was a hard thing to get through to many who believed that radium was simply a good thing, a cure-all to many illnesses, especially cancer. And then, of course, there was all the rich businessmen who were raking in the money, who of course stood by their products. Even when quite a few independent studies stated that radium was in fact harmful, the companies still stood by their product. Things probably took a turn when an old co-founder of the firm back in Orange, New Jersey spoke up against the company. His name was George Willis, and whilst working at the factory, he would often carry around tubes of radium with his bare hands, unaware what damage it was doing to him. That is until he found that his thumb had become cancerous and he had to have it amputated. In his report against the company, he claimed that he was almost certain the radium was to blame. At this point, the United States Radium Corporation, who claimed that their product was absolutely safe, did start to insist that the women no longer place the brushes into their mouths and started to issue protective gear to the women, something the scientists and the bosses had used since day one. As the women fought their case, the newspapers reported on their stories and the sales of radium lace products started to fall and people started to see it as a danger. And it wasn't long before it was proven that radium was in fact responsible for the deaths of the workers. The women now had the proof. The only problem was that by law, the girls were required to bring their case forward within two years of them getting poisoned. The problem was most of the women only showed symptoms a few years after the radium had started to kill them, so it made the legal fight just a little bit harder. The company knew it was now in trouble and they started to play dirty by trying to stall the legal attack against them in hopes the women would die before the settlement. It was also said that they even went as far as to try and tamper with the autopsy reports of the dead bodies and even dispose of the women's bones, which were soaked in radiation. All the while, the factory remained open and no employees were busy painting watch dials. At the end of 1928, what remained of the female workers won the case and they were awarded compensation, some of them on their deathbeds. Some of the radium girls sadly suffered very painful deaths. It's said that over 50 women passed away due to the radium poisoning. Some lived to an older age only to be diagnosed with cancer, while some conquered the cancer. 
The story of the Radium Girls is a tragic one, but out of that tragedy, more and more precautions were put into place concerning the handling and the use of radioactive material, and also health and safety in the workplace. Some of the Radium Girls were buried six feet under in lead-lined coffins, and it is said to this day their skeletons still glow in the dark. And even in a thousand years, when the bones are turned to dust, the radiation will still 